I've narrowed the true Christian path to being either RC, I'm assuming Roman Catholic, or EO, I'm assuming Eastern Orthodox, and I pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance, but can't I can't be certain which one it is. I know you will say EO, but I have to be sure. Okay, we'll keep praying then. God help you. What would you like to ask me about that? I can help you discern one of the things you can't discern. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if you've done enough work because the chasm is pretty massive. Like the fact that you would still think it's one or the other means that you're still in the paradigms and the presuppositions of the West in my mind. Once you truly understand what orthodoxy is and you understand the history and the theology and the spiritual life, it's not, you would not stand and say, mm, maybe I could be a Roman Catholic, maybe I could be Eastern Orthodox, which by the way, we don't refer to in those terms. One, we would refer to as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the Orthodox Church. You can say Orthodox Catholic if you'd like. You can say Eastern Orthodox Catholic, but Eastern really is, is more of a, it's not an essential at all uh, demarker. Uh, it's not what we use in the, in the symbol of faith. We talk about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's the four marks of the one church that's been given to us by God. And that faith has been maintained. The same yesterday, today, and forever. It's clearly not the case with Catholicism. And I really encourage you to watch our lessons, our 12, our 10 week lesson on ecclesiology especially the, the lecture on the Ethical Council, I think it's lesson eight or maybe six, I can't remember, on St. Photios the Great. What happened that led to the schism? Essential to know. And you will see, I think you should see immediately that both historically, theologically, and spiritually, the Pope at the time and those who were influencing and running the show there, mainly those from the North, not the Romans, but the Franks or the those... Uh, heretical Christians from the North who didn't accept the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and some of them were Arians and all the rest, they were now influencing heavily the papacy in the 11th century. And they turned and walked away from the Eighth Ecumenical Council. They turned away from their own council that they had accepted, their own teachings that they had embraced. They turned away from them. And they decided to add the doctrine, the, the teaching, and the addition which had been rejected by the Ecumenical Council under St. Photius in 879, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, which was accepted in Rome by the Romans from 879 beyond the schism. It wasn't until the end of the 11th century, to my knowledge, or even beyond, that they changed and rejected it and changed and said, no, 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 we don't recognize it anymore. That historical and theological spiritual reality there is so clearly pointing to the truth of orthodoxy. I don't know what else you need. They walked away from the faith, the council. They added the heretical phrase, which had been which had been rejected by the council. Some people say, well, the council didn't mention the filioque. It's obvious from all of the history and all of the comments and all of the minutes of the council that they're talking about the filioque. It's the one addition that had been brought to the Bulgarians and, and the Orthodox were encountering in their part of the world, in which they had rejected. It was, it's, it's obvious. Every scholar knows that they're talking about the Filioque in that council. Anybody who says otherwise is just not being honest. So just to give you one example, but if you go on, then you follow the rest of the history. You read Father Seraphim Rose's Orthodox survival course. You'll see century after century after century Catholicism in the West departs from anything like Orthodox Christianity. There's no comparison today. It's night and day. It's, it's apples and oranges. It's a chasm between the two. And the fact that, that you're still uh, maybe one or the other means you have not understood that. You've not arrived at that. You haven't seen the data. You haven't read. You haven't come to face to face with that. But that's on a one level, right? That's an historical intellectual level. The spiritual level the, of the heart coming to embrace the truth experientially in divine worship in the, in the in the lives of the saints you've got to go deeper in those if you're going to see the true face of orthodoxy orthodoxy does not is not exhibitionist it doesn't go around to the non-orthodox trying to prove ourselves trying to show off and that's not my experience anyway maybe there are people who do that but that's not normally what happens we pretty much concerned about the faithful, we're focused on the faithful. And so if you don't properly come and entertain face-to-face -face over a long time, 
you will not see the face of orthodoxy. You, you'll see parts of it. You'll see snapshots. You'll see this. You'll see that. You might see some really bad examples because people are free. They don't have to live the faith. They walk away from the faith. They're confused. They're heretics. We've got heretics in church today teaching ecumenism. So, you know, you've got to have patient perseverance, go deeper, go to the history, go to the saints' lives. And I think over time, you'll come to the conclusion it's in, it's it's inevitable that what we're talking about, orthodoxy and Catholicism, it's night and day. It's a huge chasm. And God help you to see that. And if I can, if we can be of any help here, let us know. Um, we're going to be coming out, by the way, with three, three books, God willing, in the next three or four months, all about Catholicism. One is The Rise and Fall of the Papacy. Another is Orthodox Christian Witness Concerning Catholicism, which is basically a collection of the lives of saints of those Orthodox who were either martyred or confessors or exiled or whatever. They wrote treatises against Catholicism, against papal Protestantism. And then the third book is called The Errors of the Latins, an encyclopedia of all the all the story, the history of the errors, history of all the errors that have been committed over the last thousand years, theologically, dogmatically. So those three books, if you add to that our book on Second Vatican Ecclesiology, which was written by my unworthiness, my PhD thesis, which shows just how far off they've gone from patristic ecclesiology in Vatican II, or you add another book that we publish. The Church and the Pope by Robert Spencer, or another one by Elder George Gregorio on Catholicism. You have abundant material to try to discern the truth about this question. Father, my problem is that I really am a dummy. Okay, most oh, this is our friend about the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. Most Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox teachings go over my head, as I am a pro Protestant. Uh, BG, I don't know. Uh, can God save me if my heart is in the right place, but choose wrong? Okay, so becoming a Christian throughout the ages did not mean that you had to have a high IQ. That was never a prerequisite. What you have to have, however, to become a true Christian is humility. And humility is the first step and the path to knowledge. Knowledge comes from the light of God. The light of God, the uncreated divine energies are what give us knowledge of spiritual things. And that key to having this knowledge is not intellectual power, but spiritual power. In other words, humility. The, the one who decreases himself will be exalted, right? So that's what's missing. You think you're a dummy and you don't get the doctrines. That's not really the problem. The problem is you have to double down in prayer humbly begging God, and he will show you through his providence, through people, and through your spiritual own, your own spiritual sense and, and, and enlightenment, what the truth is and where you should go. But you got to go to the Orthodox Church. You've got to go and participate in divine services as a catechumen or an inquirer. You've got to go and meet Orthodox people. You can't sit there on the internet forever and act as if you understood you will never understand orthodoxy in that way it is not possible this is not an ideology this is not a philosophy you have to experience the church they they they, they became christians in the ancient world not through the internet <laughs> not through intellectual publications and books because they didn't exist by experiencing the love and the communion of God in the church. That's how they became Orthodox Christians.